It's a bad world we live in. But guess what? This ain't our world. Amen? This is not the end for us. It gets a lot better. And uh, while I'm running my mouth, turn to Nehemiah chapter 6. You can find some of y'all's got it stuck together. You have to kind of shake your Bible and twist it a little bit, make it un come undone so you can get there. Some of you's got your tablets and your phone. It's real easy. Click, click, boom, you're there. Some old-fashioned people still got Bibles. Look at that. Old folks. You don't put nothing up there, scripture up there yet, Mark. The tyranny of distraction. Tyranny means a cruel, unreasonable, and oppressive use of power or control. Now, you can think over your life, especially you older folks like me, how many times have you tried to do something, start something, and something gets in the way? Something happens, makes you stop what you're doing, make, redirect you, distractions. And I told a story on one of my friends this morning. I'm going to tell it again. See, I had a friend that he was a real particular fella, kind of OCD about some things. He kept his truck spotless, kept his yard spotless. I hated him. I hated him. I hated him. Because he was always asking me when I was going to wash my truck or when I was going to mow the grass or whatever I'm going to do. That don't mean nothing to me. I drove by his house pretty regular. One day I drove by and his lawnmower was sitting halfway through the backyard, just sitting out there by itself. I said, darn, he must have tore his lawnmower up. I didn't think no more of it. You know, a day or two later, I drive by, it's still sitting in the same place. I said, wow, that ain't him. So I called him on the phone. I said, hey, man, what happened to your lawnmower? He said, nothing. I said, why you leave lawnmower sitting in the middle of the yard? That ain't you, man. He said, well, I got, you know, this happened, that's happened. I get right in the middle of what I, I just quit. I, I'll get back. I'm going to get it out of the yard today. About a week later, I drive by that lawnmower. The grass out there that high. <laughs> lawnmower still sitting right there. I'm going, dude lying to me or something. I don't know what's going on here. So I pulled in his driveway. I go out in his backyard. Hit the start up. Lawnmower fired right up. I said, oh. I get on it. I'm going to take it back and put it up. He's my friend, man. He's walking out of the house like, I said, dude, really, what's going on? And he started rattling off what was going on in his life. And I said, dude, all you had to do is say something. Somebody finish the yard. You don't have to leave the lawnmower sitting in the middle of the yard for two weeks. You think back on your life, you've done some stuff like that. You've moved some stuff around or something like that and meant to do something and didn't do it and got distracted and got something else going on. And then, poof, before you know it, it's two or three weeks later, months later, sometimes years. And you still, had, excuse me, hadn't finished what you started. Well, just in case you didn't know it, our God is about finishing his business. He sent Jesus Christ to finish his business. Amen? Amen. Nehemiah chapter 6. Now it happened when Samuel and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies had heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there was no breaks left in it, though I had not hung the doors in the gates. But Samuel and Geshem sent to me saying, come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Onu. But they thought to bring me harm. Now let me stop right there and give God a little praise. Y'all know my, my youngest son back there, Mr. Samuel. Mr. Samuel's in the first grade. Me and him has the same reading level. On paper, I have a first grade reading level. You know how I learned how to read? When I got saved, I told God I couldn't read the Bible. He said, you just keep reading. I'll teach you how to read. You just keep reading. I, I get it. I got that. And Ethan, I can identify. The first time I ever had to read out loud, something was a thousand people sitting out in front of me. And I swallowed my tongue at least three times. I've never been so terrified in all my life. I don't know how many words I got wrong that day, but it didn't matter because that was my place. That was my time. I was supposed to be there reading that scripture. Nehemiah was chosen by God to build this wall. He was a layman. He had a task. God has given you a task. I don't care who you are and what you are. You may not be the pastor, but God, if he saved you, he gave you a task. Amen? You've got to agree with that because he didn't save you just because he loves you. If he had a, he'd have killed you when he saved you. Why didn't he just take you home? He left you here. He left you here for a purpose. We all have a purpose. And maybe, not, maybe you are not 
given the task of rebuilding the wall around the city of Jerusalem for God's people. But God called the church today to rebuild lives, not walls, lives. Our business is people's lives. And somewhere in your life, there's somebody that needs your help. They need God's help. I have them all over the place. Some of them a lot closer than others. But they need to see a living God living through us. And we cannot be distracted by the junk that goes on in this country and in this world to keep us from doing God's business. Because regard, I asked the pastor before, I've asked some other pastors, what do you do if the county calls you and tells you you have to shut the door, you can no longer have church? The answer to that is, okay, we can't have church right there. But we can have it at my house, amen? Or we can have it in the middle of that field down there. But you understand the government cannot shut down God's church because God's church is alive. It has no boundaries. Why? Because God has no boundaries. He can go anywhere, do anything. And that's the God that we serve. Let me get on through here because this stuff gets good. So I a, sent a messenger back to them saying, I am doing a great work. Mm. So I cannot come down. Why should, I, why should the work cease while I leave it and go down with you? Wow. See, Nehemiah was a smart man, too, because he knew they were going to kill him. They know they just wanted to get him off that wall to, to finish. And you ever notice how things, when God's working really, really. Now, I'm talking to some folks in here today. You know, you've been challenged to teach Sunday school. You've been challenged to be a deacon. You've been challenged to do stuff in your life. And right before it's time to commit to do it, the devil always throws something at you to make you not do it or make you not want to do it or give you some reason why you can rationalize your way out of doing it. Something this always happens. Well, I, I'll give it to you from the other side. Pastors have to deal with this on a daily basis. Because the devil's throwing something in him. He's got 500 things going on. And he's got the, everything he wants to stop. The devil wants to stop everything. You know why? Because the devil don't want us changing lives. Because you know as well as I do, if you're sitting here today and saved, when you were introduced to the Holy Spirit of God, something had to happen. Amen? Something has to change. And the devil knows that. <laughs> but we cannot come down off that wall. But they are determined. Listen to this. But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner all four times. I love that. You keep asking, I'm going to say the same thing every time. Compromise. Compromise. Here's what you need to know. Nehemiah was called, right? And he's called people, us, ordinary people, to do miraculous things in the world we live in. And see, you need to do it because if God initiates the work, and this is a key point to the church. See, if God initiates the work, the work is supported, the work is fruitful, and the work is successful. Why? Because the pressure is off of us. Because if God, has God ever failed at anything? He will not fail. He cannot fail. But the walls are almost finished. Don't quit now. Don't stop now. If you need a metaphor today, hang the gates. Hang the gates of the wall. Because somebody needs them. Somebody really needs them. And yes, this is the first time in a while I actually wrote notes because it was too deep. It was too deep and too much of it. But God is looking for somebody to be a channel. You think to yourself, what could you really do to impress God? He made galaxies. <laughs> he spoke the world into existence. How could you impress him? He don't want you to impress him. He wants to use you. He wants to work through you into somebody's life to be a channel of blessing from God. And trust me, in that world out there, there's a lot of things hurting out there. There's a lot of people hurting out there. 
Unlike what the TV says, you know, they'd like to focus on one group or another group, but that whole world's a mess. My wife's sitting here, and I tell you, a lot of times my house is a mess. Amen? Let me get an amen. Shake your head. It's okay. See? You don't believe it. You should have been there yesterday. 14 kids in my backyard. Good God. I'm not going to apologize for what comes next. This is why we have to really think about compromise. Because that's what's happened in America today. I can't speak for the whole world because I've never been around the world. I can only speak for what I see and hear in America. The church has compromised itself clean out of business. And it's compromised on little things. The little things turn into big things. When you compromise on, well, you know, that ain't, the Bible says that's sin, but that's not so bad a sin. And I always like this one. Yeah, but that's the deacon's son. We don't want to lose a whole family just because we shun the son. Come on now. He just sings in the choir. We're just leading the praise band. It's okay. He can be that way. It's all right. Am I lying to you today? Huh? You've seen it. You've seen it. You've heard it. Look, you know the church house is full of lost people. We got them playing in the band, leading the praise. Got a lot of them right here. Sitting in a pulpit in America today. Don't know Jesus at all. But it's a good living for some of them. <laughs> mm. And I know some of y'all think you're talking to pastors only. No, you're not. We're talking to everybody. If you are called by God as a Christian then you have a ministry. Well, let's talk about the world a minute. You want to see the ultimate distraction? See, when I was a kid, when I was young, and some of y'all can say amen, you was young when I was young. It was all good. Ain't it soup? It was all good, wasn't it? But see, all they talked about was what was going on somewhere else. It really wasn't what was going on here. But most of my young life, it was focused on Israel. You know, because we were, we were helping them out. We always helped them out. We helped protect them. We helped do everything. And you really heard about it a lot. You ain't heard about it much lately, have you? You don't hardly hear it ever at all. It's a distraction. Why? Because nothing has changed. The nation of Iran still calls for the destruction of Israel every day. The leader of Iran calls for the total destruction of Israel every day. He calls it. Been doing it for how long? Since he got there. And they believe in that sect that they can precipitate the coming of their Messiah if they cause Israel to burst into flames. If they start that fire, they think their Muslim Messiah will come when the apocalyptic fire is lit all over the world. But see, they don't know what I know. <laughs> they ain't read the book. Trevor, they didn't read the book. They should read this book because the book said to the, nas the nation of Israel, what? You're the apple of my eye. I'll bless them that bless you and I'll curse them that curse you. That's what it says. And for years, that's why the United States tried to be, even though the politicians won't admit it, we try to stay on the good side because there's enough of them that still fear. <laughs> Their mama read the Bible to them when they were little boys. They can believe it might be, you know, just, just some, it might be a little truth in that thing. Just a little bit. Well, it's enough in there they should be scared of it. But see, this is what I believe today. This is what you ought to get excited about, church. The Bible teaches there's going to be a rapture. Amen? There's going to be a rapture. And, and then there's going to be a battle. The battle is at Israel. And my Jesus is going to come down and defeat every army that comes against Israel. Everyone. And I like to think about it too. Sometimes I can, I can lay there and look in my mind's eye and think about that. Think, think of all the technology that they got now and all that stuff they might send against Israel. Oh, oh Jesus looked like did on the matrix, son. He just... And everything just goes... Of course, I hope he goes... Back at you. <laughs> you like that, didn't you? I like the way down. Yeah. Uh-huh. But that's going to happen. But unfortunately for them, what happens next is seven years of tribulation. what the Bible says. Seven years of tribulation like nobody's ever seen. 
Why is it going to be so bad, Chris? Because when Jesus left the first time, the first time when the rapture happened, the Holy Spirit went with us. Does it not? The Holy Spirit, can you imagine waking up tomorrow if you saved today, if you've ever felt the Holy Spirit at all in your life? Can you believe waking up one day without it? Think about what's going to happen in this world without any of the Holy Ghost here. How much turmoil, how much fear, how much anger, how much depravity, how much junk is going to happen? I'm sorry, not my problem. I won't be here. I'm a pre-tree of God. I'm out of here. But that's why people need to get saved. They need to go with us. Amen? My nitro's in my pocket, by the way. Y'all keep that in mind. Listen to me. But see, after the seven years of tribulation, the eastern sky is going to split open. Jesus Christ is going to ascend from heaven without sin unto salvation. And his toe is going to touch the temple, not, excuse me, the Mount of Olive. And on the Mount of Olive, it's going to split it half in two. He's going to walk across the Kedron Valley, kick open the eastern gates, walk up the Temple Mount, and sit down on the throne of David, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Every, you hear me? Every knee, every tongue. And if you believe any word in the Bible, you got to believe that. Every knee and every toe, whether you like it or not, every emperor, every king, the antichrist, it's Satan himself is going to say it out loud. And we got to worry about what we're going to do tomorrow. Seriously? Are you really fearing for, for your life you do realize this is the worst part of your existence that you're enjoying right now. If you're saved today, it gets much better than this. I'm sorry, I'm just dumb enough to believe the Bible. I'm dumb enough to believe it, that there will be no pain in heaven. There'll be no envy in heaven. There'll be no backbiting in heaven. There'll be no more rumors or nothing that junk. And here's the good part. I ain't going to remember one thing about today. Of course, you know how a lost person says that. They go, well, why wouldn't you want to remember today? Trust me on that. I don't want to. I don't want to remember today. I just want to get to heaven. I'm like this. Hurry up. Come on. I'm tired. Amen, Raw. Give me an amen. I'm tired. Mm. I shouldn't do it. I should not. Y'all don't want me to get excited this morning, do they? Compromise. You know, there's some compromise you've got to have. You've got to have a certain amount of compromise to have a friendship, to have a marriage. You know, we talked about that in Sunday school this morning. What did y'all say? See, you've got you to have some compromise. Even if she thinks she's right all the time, she ain't. <laughs> but I am. <laughs> And she'd walk off going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, let's skip that page. <laughs> oh, me, but you know the devil knows his time is short. He knows that the wall is nearly finished. See, the person you're dealing with in your life or even your own heart, maybe it's your heart that's dealing with with the fact that I don't know what I'm saved or not or what I need to make a decision or I need to do something. And the devil knows that. Look, I'll give you mine right now. When I stood in that church, that day I got saved, I, I was a United States Marine two years out. And those of you that are know, you're going to start off with your right foot in your sleep. Amen. They stand you up out of the bed in your sleep. And when they say go, you're going gonna to start off with your right foot because you remember from boot camp, they punch you in the head if you start off with your left it didn't take long. You quit getting punched in the head. You start off with your right. But that night that God called me, that I, I was leaning like that. And the devil had me around the neck. Like, you ain't going nowhere, boy. You can't. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You mine. You ain't going nowhere. I don't care how you feel. And I'm fighting that thing. Everybody around me didn't know what was going on inside of me. But that battle that was in me was like, I wanted to get free from who I was, from what I was. I wanted to get free from it. Why? Because that had been exposed to me. 
And I leaned and leaned and leaned, and finally I just took off with my left foot. I knew something was wrong then. Something was different because there's no way I took off with my left foot. But I did. Best thing I ever did in my life. That day will never, ever leave me. But I didn't want to come here to talk about me. Let's talk about church. Hey, who likes to go to meetings? Who likes meetings? You like to go to meetings? No. Nobody likes to go to a meeting, right? But you go in some of these big dollar churches, I call them. Y'all get mad at me. I don't care. I ain't hired. But see, people like to meet all the time. Some folks like to meet all the time. Meet, 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 meet. Well, I don't think God called God's people to meet all the time. I think he called us to get our hands dirty and our feet wet. Let's go. He called us to work. He told us to be working for him. He didn't call us to sit around in an endless meeting. We got people out there that's got the question. What's the question? What must I do to be saved? And guess what? Where's the answer at? It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. And they can't get the answer that they need for asking the question if you're sitting around in an endless meeting. You need to be working. No, all of you ain't going to stand on this stage and know where I shouldn't be here. I don't want to be here. He called me to be here. I don't even like people. <laughs> hey, that six foot thing is the best thing that ever happened to me. Stay away from me. I'm good. I'm... My wife even put me in another bed. I'm I'm <sighs> I'm glad y'all can laugh at me. Oh, here's one for you. How about when you, when you get stirred up on something? Don't everybody try to calm you down? You remember? Come on, David, hit me out. When you get fired up for the Lord, and I bet you get on, if you get on the CB radio and get fired up and start praising Jesus, somebody's going to come on, man, shut up. Man, hush. It ain't like that. Well, see, it don't matter what circumstance you're in. If you love Jesus, you can remember what Jesus done for you. I don't matter what my, my, my circumstance is. I can remember where I was when I met Jesus and get real happy real quick. Because he shouldn't have touched me. But he did. And that's all that mattered. He did touch me that day. And... <laughs> But see, your, your preacher get all stirred up and go back to him, man, what's wrong with him? He done lost his mind. He done got all stirred up. Wanting us to do this. Wanting us to do that. Man, he done got a praise band up in here. What's wrong with him? It's too loud. I love that one. It's too loud. Mike said this morning, I won't be too loud. What I tell you? I'm an 80s rock and roll guy, but turn it up. I don't care. Because my kids ride around in my truck. They said, Daddy, it's too loud. I said, what's wrong with you? You better be glad I ain't got no system in here. I, something good come on. I'll <laughs> say, it's love. I love it when young people sitting at a stoplight, and I'm over there in my old woe-out truck, and they look over, and I'm like. <laughs> Them things are like. Well, the first thing they say is, you know, he's taking drugs out of a bottle, though. <laughs> Woo! Mm, 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 mm. But tell me this, answer me this question. How come this Americans, now here's American, and the church is guilty as this as anybody. You go to a football game, wear the stupidest clothes you've ever seen in your life, turn inside out with things on your head, your face painted up, hollering about the, the, the team, your team this and your team that. You can be a North Carolina fan, or you can be a Duke fan, I'm sorry, but you can even be a Duke fan. Or, or anybody else and go to the football game and act like a complete idiot. Scream and holler and cuss and throw things and throw hot dogs at each other and whatever. But if your preacher gets up on Sunday morning and gets plugged into another world, if he gets plugged into the portals of heaven and gets loose, gets free from himself, yes, sir. you'll call him a fanatic. He done lost his mind. When he's plugged into something that you can't even fathom to feel like. Because I told y'all before, I led a boy to Jesus a long time ago that had been a crackhead for 20 years. He didn't even know what year it was when he got saved. He didn't have no idea. 
But when he got clean and got back home and everything squared away, the first time he ever witnessed to somebody about Jesus, you know what he told them? Because it was another crackhead. You know what he told them? He said, let me tell you something. I've been high on everything known to man and some things that ain't known to man. But I ain't never been so high as it was the night the Holy Spirit visited me. I ain't never been so high as the night that I smelled some of that holy smoke. Come on. Woo! That make you want to, whoa, see the hair just stood up on my back. Mm. Well, see, I know what that smells like. You might not know what that smells like. I got to get back to a bad subject for me, and that's the compromising thing. We cannot compromise on Bible doctrine. We cannot compromise on the fact that Jesus is the divine. He's the, he is God in the flesh. No argument about it. God is not the way to, a way to heaven. He's what? The way to heaven. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. We can't compromise on that. The whole thing I went through a while ago, we can't compromise on the fact that the way, the, really the way it happens, the rapture, the tribulation, the ascension, and Jesus comes back to set up his thousand-year millennial reign. That's how it happens. We can't compromise on that. And there's all, look, look, the little things is what makes a difference to God. The little things. Jesus really did die on that cross. I don't care what your Sunday school teacher that don't know what he's talking about might say, but he literally died on that cross. He had to. He had to pay my sin debt. That's why you must not compromise on substitutionary atonement. He had to do that so that we could be saved. But he knew the end of the story. I didn't. He did. He knew how it all played out. That's why he had to finish. <sighs> I remember being a young man when somebody said, man, you believe that Jonah got swallowed by a whale? I said, look, they could have said that, that Jonah swallowed the whale. I don't know. If the Bible says, I believe it. That's what it says. I mean, they said it was a whale. The Bible calls it a great fish. And what it says, a great fish. I don't know what it was. Could have been a megalodon. I don't know. All I know is he didn't die because it spit him back up and right where he should have been to start with. God used it as a vessel to get to where he needed to be. That's a lesson in that too. You should listen to God the first time. You don't have to learn things the hard way. Ding, ding, ding. How about this one? You really believe that he fed 5,000 people with a little boy's box lunch? Yeah. That's what he said. He just said they reached in that basket, and they kept reaching in that basket. They kept reaching in that basket. They kept feeding them and kept feeding them until everybody was satisfied. I don't know how. That's above my pay grade, amen. But I just believe it because the Bible said so. And I'm not compromising on that. Listen, here's what we got to get to is Preachers and lay people in the world, I don't care what anybody else thinks of the Bible. I know what I have to think of the Bible. I know what I have to believe about the Bible. And I believe this. I'm not sitting on a stool trying to have group therapy with a bunch of people that I'm worried about I'm going to offend. What I need to do in the last days of my life is not compromise and tell people what? That hell is hot, heaven is sweet, and only Jesus saves. That's the only sermon they need to hear. That world. Now, now my blood pressure's up. And that ain't no show. For, I mean, I've been like this for three days. I must get away from that compromise, though, because they can go, whew, whew. Let's get back to that wall. That wall's a big thing. Listen to this, chapter 5. And Samuel sent his servant to me before a fifth time with an open letter this time. Listen, with an open letter saying, it is reported among the nations. And Grisham says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors that you are rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king. That you may also, and you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying there's a king in Judah. Now, these matters have been reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult 
together. You think the devil ain't good at what he does? Don't fool yourself. But Nehemiah wasn't anybody's fool. Nehemiah was called by God. Nehemiah knew that was a lie. Anybody ever lied on you? Right when you needed something the most, and somebody lied on you and turned everything upside away. But you know what? I love my grandma. You know what grandma used to say? If you don't lie, you don't have to remember anything. <laughs> she used to tell us that when we was little people. And I'm thinking, well, I, well, I, I must have told a lie yesterday. Because she said that for some reason. <laughs> mm. And grandma was where you learned that lawyers and, and police, they never answer, a, ask a question that they don't know the answer to already. Because if grandma asked you a question, don't lie because she already knew the answer. But I was plum dumb when I was little. I lied to her a lot. It cost me a lot too. We cannot even let the lies stop us from doing what God's called us to do. We cannot. No matter who it might be. People in your own family will try to stop you from doing what God would have you to do. I know circumstances. I have pastor friends that their whole life has been ripped away from them just to stop. And that might not have been the reason given, but it was they didn't understand it. You, you don't believe that church folks can be a tool of the devil? Can I get an amen? If you don't think that God, that, that the devil won't use your tongue as a church person to be an avenue for his devious disciple to fight for work, yes, he will. Happens every day. But to all of you, I say you keep pressing on. You have to press on. And I know, you say, well, Chris, you don't understand. Them people's mean, man. I had a, a, a young pastor one time. He said, man, I, I told him, I said, dude, it's your fault. You took the church. <laughs> what are you hollering at me for? Don't come crying on my shoulder. You said, yeah. So go for it, buddy. He's like, man, I said, no. Of course, I, had, I got this from an old preacher friend because I heard him say it to a young man. Why are you sitting around here whining and crying like a baby for? They crucified Jesus. The ministry ain't for sissies. It ain't for wimps. It's mean for God to call people and people to work like they're working for him. Not for them. He works for them. And if God's gave you a mission, you got to remember who you work for and who you answer to. Come down off that wall, Christian. They ain't worth it. Whether it be your neighbor that's separated from their spouse or them homeless people, they brought that on themselves. Why are you worried about them for? I wouldn't have never worried about them people if God hadn't have told me to. Amen, Ross? I could have drove right on by too. But if God goes, hey, er, over there, then you do what he says. Or not, then you pay the price. I'm going to throw this thing out in a minute, Dave, with. We must hasten on, though, because I ain't got my watch, and I don't want nobody mad at me. But listen, let's, let, me, let me get over here. Let me finish reading this part right here. And then I sent to him saying, No such things that you have said are being done. Yet you invent them in your own heart. Boy, I like that. See, Christian, you got to have enough guts to call it out when somebody brings it on you. When somebody talks smack about you, you don't mind just telling them, hey, ho, ho, you lying. Stop. Just stop. That ain't true. I got to be about his business. And be about his business. But the second thing, that blatant compromise is a bad distraction in the church house, in ministry. The second one, check this out. Some of y'all really going to get this. Biden criticism. Has any of you ever been criticized out of doing something that you really love to do? Oh, yeah. People are mean. They are. I know I got one pastor in the room now, but he'll, he'll testify to this. 
you make the town people mad, you'll to get chastised anywhere. No telling where you might be. I found out how to hold, make a whole small town USA, get the whole town mad at one time. Just like that. I didn't do that right. I can't do it with this one yet. One church sign stirred up the whole county, and I couldn't understand it. Well, you know, me, the first church I started, we had a lot of street people in it. You know, people come from all over. People was getting delivered off the street, man. So I had, and, and one, on a Wednesday night, one of the guys come up with a saying. I said, hey, that works for me. Because I had given an interview, and I told everybody, this was not your grandma's church. This ain't grandma's church. It never was meant to be grandma's church. Grandma don't want to come to this church. She wants to have church like she wanted to have it. We got to have, we're having church a little bit different down here. And everybody understood that. Unfortunately, I might not have thought that sign through. And, and Tripp, you can laugh at this one. Because we made the front page of a biker magazine, a national biker magazine, with my church sign. I didn't put the sign away, but I was responsible because I was the pastor, so it was mine. I had to own it. And it said, if you want to get high, try this joint. <laughs> True story. You call Joe Covino right now, he'll tell you. True story. <laughs> well, see, everybody that went there totally got that. Everybody that ever thought about coming to church there totally got that. Well, them little old Baptist women uptown did not like that at all. <laughs> and I found out how much they didn't like it. We had an IGA, and Brother Tony helped me out a lot. Tony owned the IGA, and you know, that's the independent. He can do what he wants to. He owns the whole place. When I had a family in need that needed groceries, I could go say, Tony, I got a family of four that need to eat, son. I'd have four buggies full of the groceries. About 15 minutes, man. He'd call, you come here, come here, come here, come here. You go get them. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And before long, I'd have a truckload of stuff to take that family. No questions asked. He didn't ever say nothing about money. That was his ministry. Pray God bless him for it. And I was standing in line there making a little small talk with Tony, and I reckon somebody said something. You know how to, y'all know how y'all women do in, while you're in Walmart, that else you just gossiping about somebody else. They stand over there talking, and I guess one of them said, who is that fellow over there? And when they said, well, that's, that's that, that preacher from down yonder, that little church right on the edge of town right there. And that little old lady that was standing there, oh, it is? Is that so? Well, she waited till I moved, and she walked right, she went by that tall. She walked right up there. She said, excuse me. Are you with that church down there? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, that's a sacrilegious sign you got. I said, it is. What's wrong with my sign? She said, you can't put stuff up like that from no church. I said, well, you wouldn't understand that. I get it. You don't understand that sign. But them people that's going to worship down there this afternoon, they totally understand that sign. Because I was getting a little bit out of Heated, so I had to get away from that. I don't want to fuss at no little old woman in public. <laughs> and so I told her, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. That's me. It's all my fault. I did it. You feel better now? And they go away. You know, it's like, go on. And, uh, but I did catch a lot of flack over that. But you know what? It doesn't matter what happens to me as long as God is getting the glory for it. It doesn't matter what happens to you on this side. As long as God gets the glory. I mean, you get fired from your job. It don't matter as long as God gets the glory. You know, years ago, Laura went through a little situation in her job. They told her she couldn't. Well, what are you going, what, supposed to pray with your patients? Really? People dying around you every day. And she struggled with that a little bit. And we had a long talk about it. And we talked about the fact, you know, if they fire you for praying with your patients, God probably got a better job for you somewhere else. So we'll take it as a blessing. Do your thing, honey. It's okay. Maybe you get a job and make more money. <laughs> but you know what? I need a, one of them doctors, some of them people. How many saliva glands you got on your tongue? There's a lot of them. You know why? The Bible says that tongue set on fire by hell. The human tongue is the most Ruthless weapon in the entire world is that tongue. I know some of y'all have heard this before, but you know, you can love your spouse for 
30 years, like the, the day is long, they can make one statement. One statement changes everything. Amen? One statement. All the love you got can turn to hate in your heart. Just let it. One statement. Don't, and, and people say, no, no, it ain't. No, 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 no. I said, you just ain't never heard the statement. Because if you ever do, you'll understand how fast things change. But thank God he is still God. Mm. Biden criticism. Folks, if we're going to work for the Lord, we're going to get a lot of distractions. And a lot of criticism. The whole world wants us to quit. Satan wants us to quit. And it's time to turn up the heat. It's never been a better time to be a serving Christian than right now because our world is dying. They don't even know what they need, but we do. We know what they need. But the last thing, I'm going to skip all the way down. Give me the last part at verse, about verse 10, Mark. I'm going to challenge all y'all to read that whole story through the end of the chapter. But I'm just going to say it right here. The last part you need to be real careful of is bad counsel. But while you're in the middle of your mess or while you're in the middle of your ministry, you better be real careful about the counsel that you take and who you listen to. Because don't you always think just because it looks like a sheep, it sounds like a sheep. Because why? They'd be wearing, a wolf be wearing sheep's clothes. Because right here, what happened to Nehemiah was a prophet gave him some Thoughts, teaching, because he, what did he say? I'll just paraphrase it through here. I'm not going to read this whole thing. But he, he told Nehemiah, well, let's run into the temple and hide because they seek to kill you. Let us close the doors of the temple. Well, Nehemiah knew his Bible, man. He was a layman. He couldn't go in the temple. Well, let me tell you what the devil does to you. He attempts you to do something wrong. And what happens the minute you do it wrong? He's the first one to go, hey, look at y'all, look, you're screwed up. Look at him, look, 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 Then he's going to rebuke you and reproach you for doing it, and he's the one that had you do it. That's how he works. Watch out who your friends are. <laughs> Just be careful who your friends are. Some of y'all got some friends like that. I had, I found out how many I had one time in my life. I thought I had about 10. I had two. Y'all think you got 100. No, you don't. No, you don't. Mm-mm. I had a brother ask me a while back, how do you know I'm your friend? I said, because you was my friend when I didn't deserve you to be my friend. That's how I know you're my friend. When I was the bad one, but you was the one. That's how you know. Bad counsel. Bad counsel. Let's get to this part. But to see today's, today's churches... And not all of them. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to put them all in one bag, but let's say majority of the United States especially. This is the teaching. It's, and I know there's some pastors that will argue with me, but the teaching is they're teaching Christianity without a cross. You're teaching Christianity without any sacrifice. You're teaching Christianity without a cost of nothing. It's just all good. You know, let's just get saved and everything is fuzzy. But they're also teaching you run from trouble. You hide from adversity. You change things. You don't want anything to be upset. But yet didn't the very things that was going wrong in your life drive you to the sufficiency of the Savior? Did they not? Look, I don't care who knows it and who don't know it. If I hadn't have screwed up enough to have been in the penitentiary, I'd have never got saved. Because I believe that was my last chance was that day. Whether it's true or not, I believe that if I hadn't got saved that night, that I would have never had another chance. And the Bible says he don't have to give you another chance either, does he? It may, may, may be your only one. You need to think about it. But our difficulties, you think about what happened in the Bible. Some of the worst things that happened to any of the people of God were it drove them to the sufficiency of the Savior. It put them where they needed to be because what? What happened after 9-11? What happened when the tragedy hits America? 
everybody turns back to the church. Of course, it didn't take long. It took about six months, and it didn't matter none at all. Everybody was back gone because nobody attacked us afterwards. And we become complacent with that again. But before I'm done, you got to understand this. Jesus Christ set the example for us to be people of God. Because when they hung him on that cross, they said, Hey, you're the Messiah. Well, come down off that cross then. If you all that, didn't he? Come down here. Come down off that wall. Jesus wasn't coming down off there. Why? He had to finish. He knew that Chris could not be saved, Trevor. I could not be saved unless he died. He had to die to pay that price for me. And I own that. But if he'd have come down off that cross, all else was, everything was off the table. But him staying there, he defeated hell and the grave, everything. He finished. And he encourages us today to finish. Now, here's where it gets real personal. Because I this 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 threw into this message because what now I'm, I've had enough. Sometimes in my life I have things have happened where I prayed for God to give me things or take things from me. Has anybody else ever been there? Yeah, you have. I know you have. Some things you want to get rid of, some things you won't. I've been guilty in my life the last I've asked for just pieces of time. And a lot of times God gives me exactly what I asked for and I still ain't happy with it. <laughs> It's funny how he does exactly what I ask him to do, and then I'm mad about it. Go figure, right? Well, in the last few months, and in the last few messages that I've had to put together and listen to him, this is what he said. Your time is up, Mr. Rollins. It's time to go. And that's where we're going. Because Samuel's old enough now. I'm going back out on the street to do what I do. And I'm going to stand up with my last breath in these last days and tell people they need Jesus Christ. I asked God when, when Laura gave birth to Andrew, I needed to back it down a little bit. I need to calm down a little bit because I need to be a husband and a father. And then lo and behold, really, I get that. Th Look, Samuel, hey, Samuel. And put my wife in a trick. Now she got two. I said, God, I need some time here. Yeah. I need some time. I need to be home a lot more. You know, I need to be all I can. I need to do my stuff. And he said, okay, I got it. But see, he's been telling me the last, it's over. It's over. Because guess what? Andrew went, he was doing ministry with me when he was three years old. And he's going back. Amen. Now both of them old enough to go back. They're going to go back with me because I'm going to do what God called me to do. And I challenge you today, you better find out what God's called you to do and get busy doing it because the wall is almost finished. And I don't know if you all have ever watched the movie. you ever watched the movie, The Kingdom of Heaven? It's a real good movie. It's a long movie based in that it's the, the Muslims are attacking Jerusalem for the 1800th time. But there's one little spot in the movie where Christians really can't get into it. It's not really a spiritual movie. It's more about the, the, the fight itself. But there's one little place, one little statement that says it all. The main character in the movie had just gave up. He, there's enough happening at Jerusalem. It ain't no big deal to him. He just wants to get out. He wants to save God's people. And he asked the Muslim leader, I can't remember his name now, but he said, all we want safe passage, you can have the city. Of course, he says, okay, good. And he granted them safe passage for everybody to leave Jerusalem and leave. But right as he walks away, he goes, hey, what does it mean to you? And he turns around and says, nothing. Makes two more steps and turns around and says, everything. Because I don't know if y'all know this. I know Rod's been over there several times. But see, they got... 
their temples, and we covered them up, and then they covered them up, and then they covered up. We covered up their stuff, then they covered up our stuff. They covered up our stuff, and we covered up their stuff. They build over here, and then we take it back, and we build over on top of it. It's a crazy mess over there. It's a mess. In the physical world, it's a teetotal mess. But in the spiritual world, it's still saved and lost. One knows the truth, one of them does not. My question to you today, do you know the truth? Jesus died for you. And he's going to stay on that wall. And I'm going to stay on my wall for the people that depend on me. And the people that God puts in my path, I'm going to stay on that wall as long as I'm here. They've had op ample opportunities to kill me. I think, let's think about Laura, about the last eight years, I've been, uh, I actually flatlined about four or five times when I, when I had my tachycardia. And they, they, they give you the shot, you know, and it kills you. They say, no, it's not that. We're not killing you. <laughs> Y'all like that when doctors say that. I said, dude, you see that little thing over there? You know what happens when it hits that, that, that line right there? You know what that means? <laughs> That's dead. No, it's not. Why it ain't? That's zero. <laughs> That's what it says. And they don't like talking to you like that, Dave. You know that? They don't like talking about death. And I'm going, I don't care. Because one of the best moments when the old doctor had his hand on my hand, he fixed to give me that shot. My heart's running about 190. He said, Mr. Rollins, I'm going to give you that. I said, yeah, you're going to kill me. He said, no, no, no. No, look, he said, no, I'm not. I said, yes, you are. He said, no, I'm converting your heart. I said, no, Jesus already did that. You can't mess that up. And I could tell, I mean, he was, he was shaking. Not me, but he was. And I'm, of course, I'm jacked up. I'm, I'm at 190, but I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I told him, I reached over and grabbed his hand. I said, the question is, are you ready? I am ready to die, but are you ready to kill a man? And he really was fried. I mean, he was, you know, he gave me that shot. And when he checked me out, I ain't seen him since. That dude left me. He come, I ain't seen that doctor since. It's okay. But Jesus Christ today, listen, I don't know where you are. 